Welcome to On the Sidelines, the show that usually discusses sports and how sports intersects our lives. However, this series of shows will mostly depart from sports and will center upon an event that is still being discussed long after most sporting events have faded from our memories. Throughout U.S. history, there are dates that are burned into our memories such as December 7th, 1941, and September 11th, 2001. This year, we commemorate the 60th anniversary of another such date, November 22nd, 1963, the day that the 35th President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. Inspired by the book, Where Were You?, that was compiled and edited by Gus Russo and Harry Moses for the 50th anniversary, I wondered what ordinary U.S. citizens were doing on that ever so ordinary Friday before Thanksgiving in 1963 that turned out to be anything but ordinary. For some people, the news of the assassination was received in this manner. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. Uh, Presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th president of the United States. But for many Americans, the news would be heard much differently. On the sidelines is so grateful to the current residents of Westboro who remember November 22nd, 1963, and who graciously shared their stories with us. Let us listen to their memories of this event. Okay, we are, have just put our feet and touched our feet over the Westboro line, and we're in Southboro, Massachusetts at St. Matthew's Parish with Father James Flynn. Father, welcome. Thank you. And we're going to go back to 60 years ago, to Washington, D.C., I believe, to the events with John F. Kennedy in that weekend, and maybe before. Can you just give us a little of what was happening? Because I know you're in Washington, D.C. So at the I was time. a uh, student at uh, Catholic University. In 19, I'm going to start at 1960. In 1960, when John Kennedy was inaugurated, and as I was suggesting a moment ago, Paul, Everything seemed so positive and progressive and happy and beautiful because we had this young um, new president who is challenging people on all kinds of social justice issues. And we as Catholics are very proud of him. Um, and then in addition, in the Catholic Church at that time, we had Pope uh, John the Twenty-Third, who um, opened up the church to be more relevant uh, to modern society. So everything just seemed to be wonderful and going beautiful, Vatican II was perfect, the country was in a good, good place. And then in 1963, um, I was, uh, it was a year before I became a priest, what's called the deacon year, and uh, I was studying at the university and on weekends would go out to uh, diverse parishes um, to help out. But on November 22nd, my first thought um, that I had in mind is we, was playing bas- we were getting ready to play basketball now this is at the seminary. You had a hoop well, out we lived back. At, what, what? We, we lived at um, a house. Right. Uh, the group of priests from um, it was the Stigmatine Fathers was the name of the priests, and they had a house on Quincy Street, which is about a mile from the university. And we would uh, play basketball during this uh, after the study period. And the, the, this this is kind of uh, funny because I cannot get this out of my mind. We we used to have. Over the net, over the basket, we would put a lock because all the neighbors would come and play 
basketball while we were studying and it was disturbing us. So the priest in charge <laughs> said, no, no, you get, they can't. And they were sick of yelling at them. So we developed this board with a lock on it. So to unlock it, you had to stand on the shoulders of one of the stu students. And I was on the shoulders of one of the students with the key. And all of a sudden... So you were locking it or unlocking it? Unlocking it. So you guys were ready to play it basketball? Was four, it was 4 o'clock. We were ready to play basketball. Yeah. And um, uh, while I was up there, while I was on the guy's shoulders, one of the other seminarians came out and said that uh, John Kennedy was shot. And of course, they dropped me. <laughs> we ran up to watch it on TV. Yeah. And that was, a, that was exactly what I was doing. We were just totally, completely shocked. And we naturally followed it all on, on TV. Um, and we, we talked, he received the last rites, and the priests were all concerned about that. And um, then we just watched it on TV for hours. And the second thought that I had in mind was, later on that evening, where our house was, was right next to the Franciscan Monastery. I don't know if you've ever been down to Washington, but there's this huge um, monastery. And hundreds of people went to confession. <laughs> it, was, it was fascinating that all these people were going to confession. They had confessions 24 hours a day, but I never saw anyone go, go in during the day. So those are, that was the day of uh, the assassination. Since we were from, um, most of us were from Boston, and John Kennedy was from Massachusetts, uh, Cardinal Cushing, who was the Archbishop of Boston, and he was a very close friend of Jack Kennedy and the whole Kennedy family. Indeed, he married um, John Kennedy and Jackie, Jackie Kennedy down in Newport. I think it was in Newport. That's correct, yeah. Um, and he was very close uh, to the Kennedy family, and he was saying the uh, funeral. And he had, we, since we were the top seminarians at the time, we were ready to be a priest the next year. Um, many of us had the opportunities to be present at the Mass, serving it in different ways. And the next thing I remember was that when they brought the body, on John Kennedy's body, back, uh, to Washington, I went to the White House, and that's the. Do you want to show the picture? Yeah. So we. So I, I always thought that they brought the the body back to the rotunda, but they did not bring it back to the White. We have a picture here of the casket, and and I believe that is in the White House. We have a couple of kneelers here, Father. If you could just explain. So that was, was in the, the that picture, as I recall it, and I've never seen one like that yeah. before, uh, but I remember it. It was. Um, when his body came back to Washington and went to the um, uh, funeral parlor, they brought the body to the East Room of the White House, and that was, that's where that picture is. And the two kneelers were that there were two seminarians from our class, from our group, that were there for an hour throughout the night. And they were praying. And, and one of the seminarians, this wasn't me, I remember him counting out, that, uh, re remembering that Jackie Kennedy came down like at two o'clock in the morning and said some prayers with the, uh, with the seminarians. So it was there that whole night. And I believe the next day, now I'm not really sure of this, but this is my memory, right. they brought it to the rotunda. Rotunda, yeah. And it was, his body was there, I don't know, it was 48 hours. Uh, it was there a while, mobs of people. It was just incredible, the, uh, the crowd. I don't remember the exact number of days, but it was going 24 hours a day. Right. And from there, the day of the funeral, they um, brought his body to St. Matthew's Church, that's the cathedral in Washington, D.C., and that's where the funeral mass was. And one of the things I read and subsequently heard people talk about it is that Mrs. Kennedy tried to replicate everything that happened at Abraham Lincoln's oh, really? yeah. um, funeral. Uh, because I don't know, there's pictures of a horseless, is that not a horseless, a uh, riderless, the, the riderless horse. The horse. It yeah. was in the procession. Right. So they had the mass at the church. It was not a big, in the Catholic church we have, in those days, we had like a solemn high mass or a low mass. And um, they decided to have like a regular low mass. And the reason was, that there'd be so many non-Catholics that they didn't want to be offensive. So someone suggested to Mrs. Kennedy, and she really 
um, um, put together all the plans as I understand it. And so it was a low mass. I, re I remember my days as an altar boy, two candles low, six candles high. That's my, right. My, my, was my memory good that's, there? That's exactly right. Yeah. And then uh, when the mass was over, it was like any, uh, it was then like Now, were any, you at the mass? You, I was at the mass. At the in mass? The, I was in the church. Uh, no, certainly no prominent place, <laughs> but I remember yeah. it. And then uh, the, it processed out. And the, the, the third thing that I remember is where I was standing, you, you often see pictures of young John Kennedy saluting his father, and that was right outside the church. I remember that vividly. And then they uh, proceeded to um, bring the body, and it was they walked to, as I recall, everybody walked. Right, right. The image I have is uh, Governor de Gaulle. Remember, he stood out among us because he was so tall. From France, yeah. So it was huge procession from the cathedral over the Key Bridge into uh, Northern Virginia um, to the cemetery. And um, if the cemetery of Cardinal Cushing was there again, and he did what they call the uh, final, final rites, which is just before they bury the body, um, they say these prayers, and he, and, and, you know, and he did that. And then the eternal flame and, right. um, was, was, was I think it was lit that day. I can't remember that though. I know I saw it at one point. Maybe it was later on. And that basically was my memory of um, what happened. But live and in color, you were there, and then yep. the basketball game never got played that weekend. <laughs> well, no, no. We totally forgot about it. But it, it's amazing. When we were talking about this a little bit, is how everything stopped. Right. You know, um, people just simply stopped, and that's why. I don't know about today, but a few years ago, everybody remembered exactly what they were doing at that time. Could, could you, I think, no matter where you were, you probably felt a difference walking out the door. I mean, the world didn't seem to be the same yeah. when you walked out that well, door. Well, look, I, I thought everything looked so beautiful and so yeah. positive about the future of the country, in our case, the future of the church, and then to have something so, so devastating to happen. And then, then all the intrigue about... Um, Ruby and Oswald and all that, all the conspiracies, it was just terrible. That yeah, carries on. Okay, Father, well, we want to thank you very much for your thank memories. You. I hope they're all right. <laughs> well, they're good with me. Thank you thank very you, much, Father. Father. Okay. Okay, we are now with Westboro Icon, Chris McKenzie, who we're proud to say was with Westboro Cable back in the early days. So she knows the studio. We're glad to have her on. And I say, God bless America. Mm. Here we are, November of 63. God bless America. What was going on in America? What do you remember from November of 1963? November 22nd was a tough day. That was the day. I remember that. That was probably one of the first crises that this old girl lived through <laughs> because I never wanted to see it. We never wanted to see 9-11. That's why the hat gets worn more than usual. But when John Kennedy, I will never forget this day. I was in Blackstone, Massachusetts. I lived in Blackstone at the time with Charlie and our two children. And I remember Oh, Lord, I, it, was, it was noontime. It was around 12.30. Well, it was right around noontime, a yep. And the noon. only reason I remember this is kind of embarrassing, but back in those days, you know, we ironed, you know, ironed. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. We ironed, and so the best time to iron was while, while Charlie Jr. was in the playpen and Taryn was probably taking a nap because she was only two and a half. And, and Charlie, uh, uh, let's see, Charlie. He was four months old. So you were a young mother at the time. I was a young mother. Yeah. Yeah. Living down there. We lived down there. <laughs> we lived down there because be, it's a long story. But we were married very young. Yeah. And so it was best that we were, at first we lived in Rhode Island. Yeah. And then when the smoke went through, we cleared, we, bit, yeah. cleared, we uh, lived in Blackstone. Yeah. And then we came home. There's no place like Westboro. So anyways, um, yes, I was there. And it was lunchtime, I remember. 
and I remember that when you're eyeing it, you, I watch TV naturally, and I can remember the program was Search for Tomorrow. How ironic. <laughs> Search for Tomorrow and Walter Cronkite came in between. It was only a 15-minute show, and then um, the next one was The Guiding Light. Right. So between those two shows, Walter Cronkite came on. Now, he's probably one of the most respected newscasters there ever was. I think he lived on Martha's Vineyard, too. But, and I know he was very familiar well, with he the was Kennedys. Well, he was trusted. Everyone believed. You be if, right. if he said it, right. you knew it was true. You didn't have to wait to prove it. You knew it was true. And I remember he took his glasses off and he wiped his brow and I started to cry. So I shut the iron off. <laughs> I started to cry because he said President Kennedy has been shot. And, I, and then, but I do remember him saying he was killed. So he, it must have been long enough for them to get word. Right. I picked up my little boy and I just, I just hugged him. And I remember just staring and staring. There was a couch and there was a big kitchen area and there was a, a couch and I sat on the couch. Cause I, I your head doesn't want to take it. Well, you, you know, you want to push it away. I don't care whether you're a Republican, Democrat, if you're called a human, that had to hit you. And when you see a newscaster crying, you know it's really serious. You know, the country was in trouble because somebody, some crazy was out there doing things that horrendous. Well, you, you didn't know what happened. I mean, when it happened, you, don't, you know what happened, but you didn't know what happened. Exactly. I don't think we, I don't think we know yet there's all kinds of theories, and I tried to follow it for a long, because I just didn't believe, how could you do that? He's driving down the street, and there's nobody around, but somebody saw somebody on the grassy knoll down there in Dallas. And, and Charlie and I ended up in Dallas. We were da down there to go to a wedding, and we have this theory, you know, oh, it's only next door. So we hop in the motorhome, and we would go. And I remember going, finally seeing what Dallas was, and it's huge and how some, nobody saw this person shooting. Mm -hmm. So I do believe he was in the book suppository. And I don't know anything about the grassy knoll, but somebody was shooting because you, I remember, I remember a, a parent, and I thought it was a mother covering, or maybe father, covering their child. They all were hitting the ground. That we saw, and the whole world saw that on TV because they had it. But you're right, for the longest time, you know, we knew he'd been shot but not the extent to what happened. And, mm. and Governor Connolly and his wife were in the front seat. Yeah, yeah. And then my heart went out to Jackie, because all I could think, M Mrs. Onassis, no, but Jackie um, Kennedy, she was young. You know, she was a young woman. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, and she'd had enough heartache already. And I just, you put yourself in the, her place and say, what is she going to do? Never mind money or anything, That's money's nothing. Mm. And I can tell you that when you don't have somebody you love. So I, I tell you, it was probably the worst day. It probably was the worst day, aside from losing any of my parents or whatever, it was probably the worst day mm. coming up in the country. Well, you, you talked about the uh, the people in Dallas protecting their kids, and, and you hugged your kids. The first do, word. do you remember when your husband came home, anything about his thoughts, or was like, I mean, we, we were all in shock. It, he didn't, he hadn't seen it yet. Yeah. He only heard, there's a big difference between seeing and hearing. Mm -hmm. He knew of it, but he he hadn't seen the video and the devastation on everybody's face and the, you know, crying. And I mean, the whole country was crying. No matter where they, where the cameras would go, they were crying, they were upset because it's like an instant realization that we, we aren't safe. We're not safe. When a lunatic is out there and will kill somebody for, you know, 
I think he was paid well, but I... I well, I think, I think the thing of it was, we didn't know what was going on. No. I mean, was yeah. was it somebody, you know, it was like when they tried to assassinate Lincoln, they were they were going after other part, uh, members of the cabinet, too. Well, was that going to happen here? We didn't know. We didn't know. Well, as it turns out, they did go after somebody, didn't they? Yeah. I was there watching TV again when Bobby Kennedy was killed, right. go, walking through the kitchen. And was it Rosie Guerrero? Rosie was the bodyguard. Yeah, he tried, tried to, to cover him. Out. You could once they let the videos out in this world, we'd have known even more. But oh back God, then, it would have been instant. Yeah. Yeah, but. but back then we only knew what what they could get to us. But yeah, I remember Sarah and Sarah. And, oh, good Lord! But the thing is, with with John Kennedy, when Charlie came home, my face my face was red, I guess, and because I'd been crying for off and on for a few hours because I just couldn't, everything was going, it is now, which I didn't think it would come back, but it, it is because, like I said, I saw Jackie in, the, in, her, in her clothes in were pink, yeah. splattered with blood and here's this woman trying to hold her husband's head together. You know, how could you even, you can't put it together you just can't imagine how bad that was. Yeah, how do you process? Yeah. I mean, it's... and then you go home and tell your children, "Daddy mm -hmm. isn't coming home." No, no, it was a very sad time, and it wasn't a moment, and it wasn't a, you know, a minute. You know, we celebrate holidays and it, it, Veterans Days and all this thing, and it seems like it's a short thing. That lasted for weeks, and it's still not gone. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it'll ever be gone for anybody who saw it. Yeah. It'll never be gone. Yeah. And it was the beginning of a, a time in this country when everything is just I, me, my, mine, and if, you, if I don't like what you're doing, I'll shoot you. Yeah. I don't like the way you drive, and I'll shoot you. You know, you jumped yeah. the light before I did. I'll shoot you. Mm. The, it, this is a wild time. You know, so we have to hang on to the, well, you know, the good man first yeah. and the country second. Well, I say God bless America. God bless Chris McKenzie. Thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome, Paul. It was nice to be back again. I haven't been in the studio in a long time. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's take a break for pictures from on the sidelines. This time, the pictures will not be ones that I took. The one that is featured is of a baseball player that played for the Boston Red Sox many decades ago. His name, Jimmy Pearsall. I was a young lad in the, in the mid-1950s when my father took me to Ralph's Supermarket on Lincoln Street in Worcester, Massachusetts. Jimmy Pearsall was making an appearance in signing promotional pictures. This was to be the first autographed picture of a professional athlete that I ever obtained. Jimmy played for over 17 seasons and had a 273 batting average for the Boston Red Sox from 1950 to 1958. He also made the American League All-Star teams in 1954 and 1956. His connection to Westboro? In 1952, he spent close to two months at Westboro State Hospital for mental health issues. His connection to November 22, 1963? According to Kate's story in her book, White House by the Sea, on November 22, 1963, Jimmy was playing golf at the Hyannis Port Country Club with Rose Kennedy, the mother of President John F. Kennedy. Now let's return to our interviews. We are with Ron Slingerling. Long, re mm. long time resident of Westboro and a businessman that in, on November 22nd, 1963, was approaching his 30th birthday. A young gentleman, 
Ron, what were you doing in 1963? And do you remember where you were? November 22nd, 1963. Long-term memory. Well, that'll help. <laughs> yes, that better. And the older you get, the better it the, is for the long-term memory. And who can refute it? Yes. And, uh, and when I heard about John F. Kennedy being shot, I was on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. What were you doing on the Turnpike? I was returning back from a general uh, meeting, yeah. a corporate meeting, down in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it lasted for three days. And it was on a Friday. And I had left, or got up and left uh, Harrisburg Motel, Hotel at uh, early in the morning. And it was about uh, maybe two o'clock, something like that, by the time I was on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And I was near the end of the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Harrisburg, and I was listening to John F. I was listening to the radio, and it come on that John F. Kennedy got shot. And you're driving. And I was driving, and I couldn't believe what I was hearing because I, my brother-in-law was a good friend of you know of of, of, of the family. And I said, I, I can't believe it was, I'm in a hearing. And it was only about five minutes later, Siren pulls me over. And he says, do you know how fast you were going? I said, no, I don't, not really, sir. I said, but uh, I'll take your word or whatever you say. And he said, you were going like 80 miles an hour. I said, my God. He said, I said, well, I said, I, I didn't realize it because I was listening to the radio and I said, John F. Kennedy just got shot. He says, he what? I says, he just got shot. It was about, you know, 1230. They said that he got shot and this is around two o'clock, something like that. He says, he didn't hear about it. And they, the, the, and he says, well, it's, it's on a, it's on the radio right now. I said, listen to it, like that. And he listened to it for a while. And then he said, my God, he says, I've, I've got to go. He says, but you have a good day. I said, <laughs> he's not going to give me a ticket for going 80 miles an hour. <laughs> no. Well, maybe he was a Democrat. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, was it a blur? Or are you trying to find out what happened? You're trying to get home? Any any memories of after the policeman said bye bye to you? That right there. Yeah. It, 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 you know, I listened, to, and then of course it goes off, and then other things come on. And, and you're, and like you're trying to radio. You're trying to get different stations too, because they didn't. You know, the, the radio stations came in and out. So somehow you were fortunate yeah. to get a radio station. Well, yeah. I was in the, uh, uh, and, I, and it, like I said, I was going to Albany, New York. Oh, you went to Albany, yeah. See, so it wasn't a, I wasn't stationary there. It was, I was moving. So I had to go from the, the Pennsylvania Turnpike to the New Jersey Turnpike to the New York State Turnpike to get to Albany. Yeah. So it was about a four hour drive, you know. So within that time, I was just scanning and listening and scanning and listening, you know. Uh, and it, it brought, you know, it was, it was a tough time for everybody in the United States. A tough time for everybody in the world, really. Something like that happens. It's a domino effect. Affects everything. It did. Cha the day changed. Yeah. The day changed. Yeah. And uh, my brother-in-law was on a helicopter assignments with Sikorsky. And he was a uh, chief mechanic in the, uh, the helicopter, presidential helicopter. So he was with Kennedy all down through the South American countries when he went on that tour yeah. down through the South American countries. And I asked him what he liked the best on the, the tour, the working, he says, I loved the Sikorsky. He says, I loved working for Sikorsky. He says, but he says, but I was, he says, amazed how Jackie Kennedy, he says, she's the sweetest person, loved her. Yeah. And he says, she was the greatest. And he says, uh, 
and he was, uh, uh, and he showed me all the uh, the uh, statistics and uh, uh, how the helicopters. He had a, a book on uh, on all the uh, the helicopter uh, 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 how it was made and stuff like that. He had a special chair that they had made for uh, for Kennedy like because that. of his back, the structure of this tie yeah. and all that. So it was interesting. And, so yeah. those were different times. Those were, uh, yeah. Well, Ron, I want to thank you for coming on the sidelines. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you. We are with longtime resident and former town moderator, Jim Tashin. Jim, welcome to On the Sidelines. And let's go back to November 22nd, 1963, right. and your thoughts and memories at that time. Right. So uh, November of 63, I had started uh, law school. I was in first year of law school in Cambridge. And uh, I do recall very vividly uh, early in the afternoon, finishing a class, coming back to my dorm, and seeing the door wide open with uh, several people sitting around the t television, total silence other than the television. So you heard nothing in your walk from the classroom? I did not. not I was not aware yeah. of anything yeah. going on. And uh, so this was early afternoon, mid-afternoon. I'm not quite sure exactly. Right. Yeah. But um, and everything was suspended after that for it, it, several days. So that's that's my recollection of what happened. Um, it was in Central Mass. Of course, this was a terrible, terrible tragedy. Sure. And um, there, there was there were a lot of solemn faces. Your thoughts on John Kennedy uh, up to that time? Were you, were you into politics at all, or any thoughts on him? Um, well, I, I, I wasn't at the time. Yeah. Um, of course, there were events that happened right after that, um, with uh, Lee Harvey Oswald being shot, and then Jack Ruby going through his uh, events. Um, the funeral and all, all of those uh, events. I was not um, one of one of the people that were actively involved in the um, efforts, especially down south, uh, to uh, work with the immigration effort. Although mm -hmm. I do remember that there were several from college the year before, and maybe a couple of years before that did. Uh, go south to um, try and help the cause. So uh, I also, in in kind of talking to you prior to today, went back and I never quite realized that uh, this stretch of time from 63 to 68 was a terrible time in this country. There were five major assassinations that took place uh, during that time. Um, first one earlier in 63 was Medgar Evers, who was deeply involved with the uh, NAACP. Uh, John Kennedy. Then a um, couple of years later, Malcolm X, uh, who interestingly was uh, assassinated by an extreme black group that, that uh, he, he apparently was became a bit moderate and and uh, they didn't appreciate that and uh, uh, then of course um, there were uh, Martin Luther King in I think 68 if 68, I'm not mistaken April 68 yeah. I believe yeah. and, and then uh, John's brother Bobby Kennedy so that five year period was a terrible time in this country, and, and it seemed that uh, bloodletting to our leaders was uh, very commonplace. Well, Jim, thanks for your memories okay. from that time, for the John Kennedy assassination, and somehow we lived through it, and the country's gone on, for yes. better or for worse. Yes, we do survive. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for asking me, Paul. Okay, thanks, John. Okay. We're with longtime resident Judge John McCann of Westboro. John, back in November of 63, your thoughts, your memories. Uh, November 22nd, 1963 was a day John uh, Kennedy was shot. <clears throat> uh, I was in the South at that time. I went to Vanderbilt Law School, and uh, it was a very different time down there. It was a height of the civil rights movement, and of course John Kennedy was involved in a lot of that. Um, and um, <clears throat> the law school was across the street from an Irish pub called Ireland's. You remember that? I remember that, and I remember what I had for lunch. <laughs> so I was in there with uh, two of my uh, roommates and uh, one other fellow whose name I can't remember. He was a United States Marine Corps uh, <clears throat> veteran, and I think he fought in the early wars of Vietnam, 1965, before we really got involved. Yeah. And the um, and he he was a tough-looking guy. And all of a sudden, he looked at me and he started crying. And I said, what's the matter with you? And he said, the president has just been shot. Now, were you in your dorm or No, no, I was, in, I was in the, I was in, it's a restaurant. Oh, I'm sorry, a rest, excuse <laughs> me. It was a pub. Yeah, a pub, yeah? so <laughs> and, you're in the uh, pub. Yeah, and, uh, and he started crying and he was just, he was uncontrollably uh, moved by the whole thing. And, and uh, so he, he finally got up and left because he just couldn't watch the news anymore. But I remember uh, I was there and I, had, I was having a hamburger for lunch and a cup of coffee and getting ready for the afternoon classes. And it was, it was pretty dramatic. The whole town just kind of stopped. Now, Vanderbilt is where? It Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, it's in Nashville. <coughs> Music okay. City, USA. Yeah. yeah. So did you go to class? Do you remember that? Uh, I think classes were canceled, yes. if I recall correctly. Yeah. Everything was. Yeah. So, you know, for the next three days, everybody was just watching television and the whole event that was happening and, and uh, all listening to all the rumors that were out there. And well, I think that's what happened is, is once you heard it, things changed. Automatically, you didn't go to class. Automatically, Everything changed. Everything no, nobody stopped. had to tell you that things had changed. No, yeah, we just, everything just stopped. And people were just kind of numb walking around and, uh, you know, shaking their heads. And it, w it was a traumatic time for the town down there. And that was Nashville, Tennessee? Nashville, Tennessee. Wow. Yeah. Okay, John, well, thank you very much for that memory. I don't think we've had anyone from a uh, memory from the South, so, <laughs> so yeah. it certainly helps. Yeah, that was a... It was a moving time down there, the civil rights era. Everything, yeah. Everything, everything was happening. And, you know, to have that happen on top of all the other stuff that was just going on was pretty traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks, John. You're welcome. Thank you. Good to see you again. Good to be seen. We now welcome longtime Westboro resident, Bill Lenane. Bill, welcome to On the Sidelines. Thank you very much. <laughs> Back in 63, uh, November 63, you were still, a, I guess you were a Westboro resident almost forever. Is, uh, uh, no, uh, no, we came in 54. Yeah. Uh, came back after my dad passed away. Um, the family was here in fourth generation, so Mom needed some assistance from the family, so we moved back. I went to high school here, so. Yeah. And after that, I graduated. Graduated in 58, went to Wentworth. Um, later on, got a degree at night. But uh, I was on a job up in, in Vermont. And so that was for November 22nd. Oh, so you weren't here in Westboro. You were on the I, road. Is, well, I was on the road. Yeah. But that was Thanksgiving weekend. Right, that is correct. So I came home, uh, visit mom. She probably demanded I came home, but <laughs> anyway. I don't know I why, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> Needed the lawn mowed. Well, it wouldn't be mowed then, but anyway, something else. Now, who, who were you working for? What were you doing at that time? 
Uh, I'm a civil engineer. So, yeah. I was doing a road project up in Vermont, Interstate 91. It was an interchange uh, in, let's see, that would have been a, in a Scutney, Vermont. Yeah. Uh, so, like I say, long weekend, so I came home. So, and, uh, and, and in those days, the roads weren't what they were today. That would, absolutely That would have not. taken you a little bit of time to get back you, home here in yep. Westboro. It used to take at least two and a half hours coming back, and now it's pretty much an hour to get up that far, mm -hmm. so, or an hour and a half. Yeah, but, right, yeah. Yeah. Not as, not as much scenery. <laughs> yeah, a little bit different, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I was back here, and... Uh, I remember hearing it that day, but it gets, there was so much news that day. So trying to decipher what I heard at the moment versus what I heard later in the day and the following day yeah. with all the uh, commotion and the swearing in and in the plane and all the rest of it. It was, but the shock, there's no question about it, the shock of how could this happen? And uh, then being young and probably not paying attention to politics as much, it was a learning curve. What what the country had to go through and exchange and all the rest of it. But um, that was the that, and of course they kept replaying how it happened, and that was devastating to anybody that had any any brains whatsoever. I mean, it was it was a shock because right before that. Um, again, I don't remember whether I was watching at the time, but right before that, he was smiling. Jacqueline was there and all the rest of it. And then, you know. So would you, do you remember if you would have gone back to Vermont after that? And, or uh, Me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, because it, it was like, it was a switch and the world changed there yeah. for a while. Oh, yeah. And yeah. now you're back in Vermont. Yeah. Any remembrance of Vermont had it, everybody had a different feeling. Well, it was kind of, uh, this interchange we were building, um, uh, first of all, I was uh, an engineer, learning engineer. I was with a fellow named Duncan Monroe, and he w he and I were friends up until he passed away a year ago. It was a long-term relationship. Yeah. And uh, so there was no question. There was a lot of discussion between he and I and the, and the workers, you know, at the break or early in the morning. Uh, but the other one I remember, there was a, I think his name was... Tierney, yeah, his last name was Tierney, I think. It was a, a farmer that uh, lived in and wouldn't give up um, where he lived, right in the middle of this interchange and a rock cut that we had to make. And so he was definitely part of the conversation, you know, just an older gentleman and from Vermont. He certainly didn't have TV, but he knew like people do, that he knew everything that was going on. Yeah, he was totally shocked. There's no question about it. So. Yeah, well, I think the whole country was. Oh yeah, yeah. and especially here in Massachusetts. <clears throat> so yeah, no, it, that's right. There's no question about that. Uh, so okay, well, we want to thank you for coming on, giving us your remembrances, uh -huh. and all the best. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. Nice to be here. Thanks, Bill. That concludes part one of our five-part series, Westboro Remembers, November 22nd, 1963. I hope that you will join us for the remaining parts and more memories from the people of Westboro. Until then, this is Paul McGrath saying thanks for watching, and I hope to see you at the game. And if you are not playing in the game, I hope to see you on the sidelines.